Seems like you can really do some kicks in my butt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, so I said a couple of topics ago that uh, things were hard um, and that they were going to get easier. And I kind of lied because today they're going to be really hard. In fact, I would say that today, parts of today will be fine, but when I taught this course, probably in its first couple of iterations, this topic I really just kind of glossed over uh, because it was just too much to dump on students. But there's a couple of reasons why, uh, last, last time I taught this course was probably the first time I really went through it in detail. Uh, but the main reason why we really have to talk about it is because if you don't talk about this, you really can only talk about half the Higgs model story or the Higgs mechanism story, and I want you to kind of understand the whole thing. And then also there's a pretty big uh, thing going on right now with neutrino oscillations and measuring neutrino masses and so what we're going to talk about today really plays into that. Um, so uh, I'm just going to apologize in advance. This is going to be a little hairy. So just fasten your seat belts and hang on for the ride. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, sort of explore the uh, Dirac equation by writing down some solutions. And then we're going to talk about a couple of different means by which we can classify states uh, that come from solutions to the Dirac equation. So for starters, let's solve the Dirac equation. In the simplest scenario, and we're going to just solve the Dirac equation itself, not the adjoint version of it. We could always solve the adjoint version for the adjoint versions of the spinners. We could just solve the Dirac equation and then take the adjoints, and those would be solutions to the adjoint equation. Uh, but we're going to pick perhaps the simplest uh, ansatz, uh, and that is we're going to try and describe a particle which is at rest. So what we have in mind here is that all the spatial derivatives are going to vanish. And this is interchangeable with the statement that the momentum is zero. Not that the four momentum is zero, bear in mind. Something has four momentum, um, whether you like it or not. But if it's at rest, the spatial momentum is zero. And uh, you can obviously see that by virtue of the exchange in the quantum mechanical context of the momentum operator and the partial derivative operator. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. <coughs> I apologize. I, I'm kind of jetting ahead. Um, uh, oh my gosh, no, no, this is, this is, I'm sorry, I just wrote down a totally useless thing. This is actually what you would do if you were describing a particle, sorry, and you were uh, describing its position as a function of time, and you wanted to say the particle is at rest, then you would impose these conditions. We are, of course, studying <coughs> field theory, so what we have in mind when we want to talk about a particle as a field excitation, but that field excitation is sitting at rest, is we want to say that the derivative of the field with respect to the spatial coordinates is not varying um, with position. Okay? So. Should that be XYZ? Uh, yes, XYZ. <laughs> <laughs> it's not right now. It's just XXY. <laughs> oh, 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 sorry. Sorry, sorry. It's a real story. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's one of those days. I just, yeah. It's one of those days. Okay, um, so with that in mind, um, if I write down the Dirac equation, uh, assuming all of the derivatives in the spatial directions are zero, then the d mu is only going to get a term. Okay, I don't know what's going on with my zipper, but it's catching the hair on my neck and pulling it. It's killing me. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, it's really annoying. Uh, uh, since only d0 is non-zero, then when I do this contraction and sum over the mu's, I'm only going to pick up a contribution from d0. So I got gamma mu d0 psi plus mc over h bar psi is zero. And if we remember the form of uh, gamma zero, that's just zero minus i minus i zero uh, d psi d c t. Remember, x0 is ct, to get the dimensions right, um, plus mc over h bar psi equals 0. And uh, this is actually straightforward to solve. I'm just going to write down the solutions for you. 
Um, of course, these are four component spinners, so every solution I write should have some representative for all four of these components. And then here's our set of solutions. Uh, and by the way, if you're, you can always remember that this is a four by four matrix, so secretly this is the identity times minus i. Mm -hmm. And so when you start applying it to uh, the derivative and you're combining it with the original psi, you're going to, this is going to descend to component equations. I'll just write one of them to give you an idea. But one of the component equations looks like this. So generally the, com the component equations are pairing up a component of psi with the derivative of a different component. And you can write down the, the rest of the expressions that follow from this. And then we end up finding four independent solutions that take the following form. So for a spinner at rest, we have uh, some normalization factor, which I won't worry about. And, then, and the, the one, two, and so forth, uh, these superscripts and parentheses, those are not labeling components, they're labeling different solutions. Franco. What was it saying on the first side? Uh, it was in the back here, see it. Well, you guys should uh, you have rolling chairs. <laughs> For Christ's sake, you have rolling chairs and you are in the very back of the room. I have about this much pity for you. <laughs> Scoot your ass up to the front of the room and oh, get some glasses or bring some binoculars. What is it you want to clarify? What does what say? Oh, I got it. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll, here, I'll write this one a little bit bigger just in case you had any questions. <laughs> Guys, you're driving me nuts. I don't know why he's and there's a cluster right near the camera, and then there's no man's land, and then there's all of you who want to hide behind the podium. I just, but I never took a class in a room with rolling chairs, so I don't know. Jacob, what? Is that only c squared, or is that whole quantity squared? Uh, no, it's just c squared. Yeah, and, and it's just c squared. It's just c squared. Um, and I kind of understand why you might ask that, but uh, if you'll notice, if I multiply through by c, this becomes c squared, and that's where that factors. Uh, anyway, okay, so e to the minus i mc squared over h bar times time, uh, which is factor one over root two, and then I've got zero one zero one. You know, if I if I wasn't comfortable enough with you guys, like, oh, maybe you could like complain to somebody about the way I treat you, but <laughs> <laughs> but I, I had a song saying to me last time I taught that I like should have been offended by. <laughs> but I was cool with it, so I'm not gonna worry too much. Okay, I'm actually writing all four of these because there's important distinctions that we need to know. Is that these three? Uh, yes, it's with oh, you're kidding. Oh, those in the front can't three. see. <laughs> What does what say what? Yeah, this one, two, three. Three. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's not as easy as one two. I really I really should just read what I'm trying to take on. I think we should just give up on this class. Just like I'll go home. Whoa, hold on. Whoa. Hold hall door. Right. Hold Spoiler. The door. Spoiler. <laughs> All right, so. Okay. Now, again, you know, this is like any any solution to a differential equation or the you know the result of an integral. You don't have to take my word for it. You can show very simply that those will satisfy the four equations that you get out of here. Just bear in mind the th the one and the three you see in this are labeling components. The one, two, three, four up here are labeling the solutions. So you would take this one solution, which has components psi1, psi2, psi3, psi4, and you would show that those four components of that single solution satisfy the four equations here. And then separately for the second solution. Okay, so you understand how that goes. Okay, now, a very interesting observation. In a quantum mechanical system, with time dependence, we usually expect the time evolution of the system to be governed by a factor which takes the following form. Okay, everybody familiar with that? 
expression. Okay? You can kind of think of it as the uh, unitary operator built out of the Hamiltonian, which uh, uh, generates translations and translations in time. And then if you're acting on some energy eigenstate, then the Hamiltonian operator just re reproduces the energy eigenvalue, et cetera, et cetera. But nonetheless, this coefficient or this factor is what we typically expect for a quantum mechanical system uh, as a description of how it evolves in time. And in, since we're dealing with a relativistic, sorry, this should be, yeah, this should be minus. And it's minus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so for uh, a relativistic system at rest, we have that the energy is mc squared. So you'll notice these factors provide for us the standard time evolution factors that we would expect for a quantum mechanical system. Where it gets interesting is with solutions three and four. Okay? So what do we make of a system which seems to be evolving with time according to a factor like that? So these are what were eventually understood to be the antiparticle solutions or the antimatter solutions. And uh, there's many different ways that you can kind of think about this. I think the original proposal, or one of the early proposals by Feynman and Stuckelberg is, so, so one way that you can think about it is, oh, this is a state that secretly has negative energy. So this E is actually a negative number, and then this is the normal time evolution factor. You're just, that minus is shoved into E. Uh, Feynman and Stuckelberg, on the other hand, proposed that uh, no, these are in fact, and, and by the way, the negative energy interpretation is more akin to the whole theory. And that's a proposal from Dirac trying to explain antimatter is you start out with this sea of filled states, and then to create a particle, you actually pull a particle out of this sea of states, and that's the electron you see, and the empty vacancy left behind is the anti-electron, okay? And so if the electron has energy, the anti-electron would have negative energy. The negative energy propagating forward in time would give you the normal time dependence. Uh, Feynman and Stuckelberg, on the other hand, proposed that, no, this is in fact a positive energy particle, and we will eventually say, you know, that anti-particles carry positive energy. Rather, what's happening is they're moving backwards in time. So it's a much more natural resolution than the uh, Dirac C argument. <laughs> now, the, no, 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 so seriously, the Feynman and Stuckelberg interpretation, we don't, really have to, we don't really have to hammer on this in terms of a particle interpretation because after all, we're not dealing with particles fundamentally, we're dealing with relativistic fields. But when we eventually do Feynman diagrams, the Feynman-Stuckelberg interpretation will actually kind of play out in Feynman diagrams because what we'll, what we'll find is that when we're describing things that proceed in time to the right horizontally, for example, and we want to distinguish between a particle and an antiparticle, we can just reverse the flow. And so we will actually, in Feynman diagrams, think in terms of particles moving forward in time and antiparticles moving backwards in time. And in fact, that's how we recognize them. So there's some sense in which the interpretation uh, lends itself to, to use. We're not really worried about interpretation. We just take these as four solutions, and then we see what we can do with it. All right. And we have four solutions as promised because as we finished up uh, talking about last time, one of the roles of the Dirac equation is to reduce the ostensible eight real degrees of freedom that you started with down to four real degrees of freedom. Now, um, doo, 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 doo. okay, so, uh, so if we take these, so these are the particle <coughs> solutions, and these are the antiparticle solutions, and we might now ask ourselves, okay, so I have two particle solutions and two antiparticle solutions. What's the difference between the two particle solutions? And then what's the corresponding difference between the two antiparticle solutions? And to see the difference there, we can just remind ourselves of the form of the operator which measures the spin along a z-axis, some fiducial z-axis we pick in space uh, against which we're going to measure the component of the intrinsic spin. And it turns out that for our choice of the gamma matrices, the form of the spin operator just becomes h bar over 2 times a block diagonal of Pauli matrices. 
And again, these act on psi. Okay, and if you don't remember the form of the Pauli matrices, well, again, according to our convention, it's just one minus one, one minus one. So it's one minus one for a sigma z. And so now we can actually take the spin operator, act on this guy, and what are we gonna get? Well, this guy is only non-zero in the first and third place, so I'm gonna grab the first and third of these diagonals. And so it's just gonna return a one, or actually an h bar over two. But if I let it act on this solution, which only has non-zeros in the second and fourth, it's gonna use the second and fourth terms in the diagonal and return minus h bar over two. Okay? So what we can say is that uh, Sz on psi one at rest is plus h bar over two, psi one rest. Sz on psi two rest, minus h bar over 2, psi 2 rest, and Matthew Kowalski is going to be more than happy to either give me a bite of his food <laughs> or tell me what eigenvalue you get when you apply Sz to psi 3. Uh, first, I add to a particle solution. I did wasabi, you're interested, but... Um, <laughs> Love wasabi. Yeah. <laughs> you're, for the first one, I mean, you get zero. Well, it's a negative one, one, and a negative one. Yeah, so, let's see. But that's not right, so. Uh, I mean. You probably ought to just cool your jets on eating up your sushi and pay attention to class, boys. <laughs> Hope it goes down smooth, buddy. Does anybody want to help him out? Franco? Can you see well uh, enough to help him out? Yeah. What do I get? Can I see? Can I see? Wait till I start muttering. It's going to be hard to hear, too. <laughs> so, the, so, no, I understand why you're getting hung up. You're getting hung up because this is positive and this is negative. Yeah. That's irrelevant. What you need to be looking at is which of these elements you're using. And for these two... For these two, the second and the fourth, you're using a minus and a minus. So that makes it a negative h bar over two? Yes. Right. So you're going to get an overall minus sign. That's fair. I mean, if I multiply this by minus, it becomes minus. And if I multiply this by minus, that becomes plus. But I multiplied the whole thing by minus. Fair. So that, that's the important observation. That's fair. So you'll notice something funny. It's the third antiparticle solution, or the third solution here that actually corresponds to spin down along the z-axis, and then I won't punish anybody with this one because the result is obvious. That psi four corresponds to the solution with spin along z in the positive direction, okay? Yeah. It's gonna get ugly. We are clearly not interested in thinking too hard about spinners or fermions at rest for two very important reasons. Number one, we want to smash shit together, and it's hard to do that when everything's at rest. Uh, and even if you start with something at rest, something is going to come out at non-zero speed, so you're gonna to have to be able to describe things that are moving. Uh, but additionally, there are certain things which cannot be brought to rest, such as? Photons. Any massless particle. Okay, a photon is a, is a wonderful example that's, that's, that's horrible in this context because we're talking about the Dirac equation. So what example should you have put forth, Matt? Yes. Mm -hmm. All chatty back there. Massless fermion. Neutrinos. Yes, neutrinos, thank you. Massless fermions and neutrino. So a neutrino would be an ostensibly massless particle which is described by the Dirac equation. For photons, you would use the Proko equation. So, Okay, so what we really need to do is go beyond. Don't worry, we haven't really gone over the particle content of the standard model yet. So if you're sitting there going, <laughs> was I supposed to know that coming in the door? It's okay. Well, yeah, Max, that's why I well, no, no, no. So, so we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that in due time. For now, and until I say, we'll think about that, we're going to take neutrinos to be massless, but a lot of the machinery we're going to talk about today is part of that story. They at very least have a very, very tiny mass, 
So there is a certain sense in which uh, they will. So actually, actually let, me, let me come back to some of these observations after I've covered the content today. Because it gets a little weird, like what does it mean if something is almost massless? Because you would think, wow, that's like, if you're almost massless, you can be brought to rest. Whereas if you're massless, you can't be brought to rest. But there's a certain functional sense in which if your mass is almost zero, it's pretty much like your mass is zero, okay? And we'll, we'll talk about that in due time. Um, but for, for, for now, until we get to those subtle complications, we're just going to assume a neutrino is an example of a massless particle, but we'll just say a massless particle, and if it's a neutrino, we'll talk about neutrino. Okay, so nonetheless, no matter what, we need to be able to describe solutions to the Dirac equation which actually have non-zero momentum, and we might expect that they're going to be more complicated than the zero momentum solutions, but in particular, in addition to being more complicated, they're going to have a, uh, a more challenging uh, description in terms of uh, identifying what states they correspond to. In particular, we'll find out that this classification fails for things which are moving. Okay. So without any further ado, if I'm trying to solve the Dirac equation for particles which are uh, in motion, then I cannot assume that the spatial derivatives vanish. That's interchangeable with the statement that the spatial momentum is non-zero. We have to start somewhere. And so as we typically do, we'll start with an unsatz, and then we'll plug the unsatz into the Dirac equation and then beat out the specific uh, expressions for details of the unsatz. But our unsatz for uh, motion is the one we almost always take in physics when we want to describe the simplest, uh, the simplest systems in motion, and we'll do uh, Jacob Brannan. Right? Yeah. So whenever you in physics have said, I want to try and imagine what the mathematical description of something that is moving in a certain direction with a certain momentum, what onsets have you almost always taken? Uh, what I mean by onsets is a guess for the form of the solution. <laughs> oh, why? <laughs> Plane, wave. Plane wave, exactly. So we're going to assume a plane wave form for the solution. So remember, we're not studying particles. We're studying fields, so we're studying continuous systems. This is a lot like when you solve the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is a wave equation. Although it's not a field theory, you're still solving a, an equation for a continuous system. So when you have a wave, or any continuous medium, medium, and you want to talk about solutions that have a definite direction of propagation and definite momentum, then you're talking about plane wave solutions. And then if you want to try and you know, localize the position as well, then you're starting to get more into wave packet land and things get more complicated. But the simplest types of solutions are just plane wave solutions because they're solutions with definite momentum, uh, direction and magnitude, and completely unresolved position. Okay. So if we take a plane wave on sides, hopefully you're roughly familiar with what that looks like. There's going to be some exponential dependence on time and space, which because we're in covariant land, we can just bundle together into a four position vector. So x mu has got ct xyz built into it. k mu is going to be a wave vector, but this is covariant. So our wave vector will have four components, a time component and three spatial components. And then <coughs> Uh, we're going to have some factor which is going to encode what's going on with the spin. So you can kind of, A is obviously the normalization. This is going to encode the plane wave type behavior. So this is going to be, if you will, the part that guarantees we satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation. Okay? And the real interesting part of these solutions is going to be what's going on with the spin part of the solution. Okay, and of course, uh, as, as is usually the case, when we take a plane wave on sets, the real beauty of it is that when I take spatial derivatives of the on sets, because the only position dependence is in this exponential factor, the, the derivative with respect to position just yanks down a factor of minus i k mu. And so this just becomes minus i k mu times uh, psi. And so I can take my Dirac equation and replace the derivative term with minus i k mu psi. 
So now I'm solving this equation. And what is nice about that equation compared to the original equation? Wolfgang. What is so nice about this equation? Compared to this equation. It's not a differential equation. Exactly! The wolf is on it! Give me a howl. Give me a howl. <laughs> Woo! Oh, <laughs> it's algebraic. There are no derivatives. Okay? It's an algebraic equation. Okay? It's not completely trivial to solve, but if you beat on it enough, then you will discover the following set of solutions. First of all, uh, and the solutions, finding the solutions I will post in the lecture notes, but I'm certainly not going to write these up on the board. It's just a long, tedious process of plugging this ansatz into the equation and then massaging, massaging, massaging. Uh, the solutions are, first of all, in the process of checking the solutions, you will verify that the plane wave or the wave vector k mu is proportional to the momentum vector. Okay. And then we're going to have a set of four solutions again. And they will again have some normalization constant. This time, though, we'll have a more interesting uh, factor in the exponent than the rest mass term. Of course, we already know what we're going to get in the exponent because it's given by the uh, assumption in our ansatz. Uh, but here we go over h bar and psi 3 will be a e to the minus, the same factor. Um, and psi 2 the a e to the i p mu x mu over h bar times a factor and then one side four. Okay. All right. So kind of getting things set up. I'm not done writing the, the solution yet. <laughs> We can immediately see that we're still going to have the same sort of classification of solutions. Um, these are going to correspond to particles which we can interpret as positive energy particles moving forward in time. Uh, these are going to correspond to things which we could either imagine as negative energy particles moving forward in time or positive energy particles moving negative in time. If the minus confuses you, remember that for a particle at rest, which is that case, the dual four momentum is minus mc zero vector. So to connect this to that, this sign would actually get negated by the fact that it comes out from the dual form momentum. Okay? The only reason I'm pointing that out is because I want you to remember this set of solutions corresponds, if you take the limit, to this set, and then 3 and 4 corresponds to 3 and 4 over there. Okay? So these are going to be our particle solutions. These are going to be our antiparticle solutions. Again, you don't have to take my word for this. You can go and you can plug these into the Dirac equation and show that they satisfy it. But here is the part where you might have wished it had gone otherwise, but we just have to accept the reality. In this case, the four spinner parts that actually describe the spin part of the, the field are simple. In this case, they're not. So. Franco, you might as well just get up and move to the front of the room because you are never going to be able to see this. So, um, oh, I can't even read my own paper. <laughs> I don't know how in the world Frank is going to be able to see anything. <laughs> okay, so what you notice is something, first of all, very distinct from this case. 
That is, the actual components of the spinner, the, 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 the part of this solution which is describing what's happening to the spin degrees of freedom, are energy and momentum dependent. Here, they're just constants. Okay? But here you get some energy and momentum dependence. Now, this feature is something radically different than anything you've experienced in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So when you encountered spin in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, when you solved the Schrodinger equation, you always found solutions where there was a spatial part of the wave function, and that had some dependence on x and t. And then if it was a spin type particle, say a spin a half particle, to describe what was happening with the spin part of it, you just tacked on a constant spinner chi. And this chi had no dependence on x and t. It was a little more like this. But this, is, this was the case even if the particle was moving in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay? But this is relativistic quantum field theory. We have relativistic spinners, and unfortunately, when they're moving, they're quite a bit more complicated. In particular, the actual description of their spinorial part is non-trivially dependent on energy and momentum. And notice there's no way you could just extricate all of this as an overall factor. If you could, then you could write this as a bunch of constants and just say there's some coefficient, but you can't. I mean, you can't just factor that out, okay? Now, this is going to lead to a lot of headaches, okay? The first headache is the observation that, unlike this case, these are not eigenstates of S sub Z. So let's just look at one example to see that. Remember our S sub Z operator. If I take one of these solutions and I act on it with the S sub Z operator, the issue is that unlike here where you only had two non-zero components and they always happened in either one, three, or two, four pairs, so you're always picking up the one, one, or the minus one, minus one. In all of these solutions, there's three non-zero parts. So one of them is always going to pick up the opposite sign from the other two. But that means you can't factor out just an overall sign. So if you act on this thing with S sub Z, you're going to get a plus for this, a minus for this, a plus for this. And I can't just bring that out as an overall plus or minus. Okay. It actually changes the state. Hence, it's not an eigenstate of the Z component of spin. Okay, so um, you might say, well, and, and, and by the way, before, before we dig further into these complications, um, in your homework, you're going to get the relatively straightforward task of demonstrating that these reduce at zero uh, for a particle at rest to the set of solutions there. Okay. Um, but you might say, okay, I can't categorize like this solution versus this solution uh, based on, you know, one being spin up along Z or spin down along Z. So is there any kind of classification or any set of eigenstates of uh, spin related operators that I could use to classify these things? And the answer is yes, but the answer is tied to the fact that these things are actually moving, okay? So if we think about it, um, when something is at rest, there's no preferred axis in space, right? X, Y, Z are just as good as each other. When things are moving, there's automatically a preferred direction in space. What direction would that be, Brooks? The direction they're moving? Exactly, yeah. Some of these questions are pretty easy. <laughs> the direction along which they're moving. So if instead of imagining that I want to measure the spin along Z, I instead wanted to measure the spin along the direction of the momentum, then we might hope 
that there's some simplification. Now, you might say, well, how do I define an operator for the spin along the momentum when I haven't even specified the momentum? Like, what would that operator look like? What it looks like. What it looks like. Damn straight. Now, you, so you could, you, could, you could take some linear combination of SX, SY, and SZ that are each weighted by PX, PY, and PZ. Right? Yeah. Everybody agree? Because if you know PX, PY, PZ, you can use those to figure out the total momentum. But if you just do a linear combination of SX, SY, and SZ using those as coefficients, then that would be the spin operator along the direction of the momentum. But that is way more work than you need to do. Don't do it. Okay? There's a way easier way to do this. And that is, let's just align our coordinates so that one of the coordinate axes points along the momentum. So let's use the freedom of our coordinate system to redefine everything so that our particle is propagating along the z direction. We can do that, right? Because there's no x, y, I mean, look around. Is it hot in this room? It feels like 80 yeah. degrees in here. I am like on fire. Uh, um, if you look around in this room, there is no x, y, and z axis. Like, the, you know, it's God given. Here's this one. Okay, no, we can pick any x, y, z we want. So when we go and look at a particle that's moving, we're free to say, hey, I'm going to pick my z axis to be along the direction he's moving. And then x and y, just some directions orthogonal to that. Now, what that means is that if I make this choice, px and py are zero, and pz is exactly the magnitude of the momentum, p. But look at what glorious thing happens. This term disappears, this term disappears, this term disappears, and this term disappears. And suddenly we get back to that nice structure of having two non-zero terms in exactly the places where we get pairs, and I erased my spin operator, where we have pairs of plus one or pairs of minus one. Okay? <laughs> All right. So what we're describing now is in terms of uh, classifying, so let, let's actually just do this for the particle state so I have something concrete to point at. So if I come in here and I take my, co my coordinates to align with the z-axis along the momentum direction, then I'm getting rid of my px and py, and pz is now just p, and then again, I'm getting rid of px and py, and my momentum here is just p, and now acting with the spin operator, again, I'm gonna pick, but I'm gonna use one and one here, so this is going to be And in this case, I'm going to be using the minus one, minus one from the diagonal, and so I'm going to have. Rochelle, go ahead and ask your question. I'm wondering, like, why did the, the equations that you originally wrote up on the board, they look like, like you couldn't just swap the x and y and z around. So I don't know, like, it seemed like they were already preferring z. Like, the Z was, like, in a different place. Like, it didn't seem... Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a really good question. And who am I going to get to help you answer it? Uh, Joe Bales. Great. When I... <laughs> Great. When we, when we had these wonderful expressions, which I just erased, PX, PY, PZ were all in different funky places. So it didn't really seem like those were rotationally invariant. So why, why were those, why is it that PX, PY, and PZ were not being treated in the same way or as they appeared in the solutions? Well, my best guess would be that by convention, we usually put spin in the direction of Z anyways. But I'm not sure if that is what you're going for. I think Jacob Wachowski really wants to help you. <laughs> Go for it. The direction of the plane wave we set to be propagating in uh -huh. the Z direction. No, no, we did not. No. Oh, I don't know. X Does it have something to do with uh, the coordinates being in certain places in mu? 
the like coordinates being in certain like places in the, the mu go ct xyz no. no brooks i'm not raising my hand i'm just scratching my nose <laughs> franco <laughs> Give one more time, the question, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. So I was wondering if I'm going to I'm going to give you the further room for us there with. So the, the, the observation was, so let me actually just go back and restore it. Um, so this was like uh, P X over M C with a minus, and then this was minus I P Y over M C. Normally, we like to think that if things are rotationally invariant, x, y, and z should be interchangeable. So why is it that pz, px, py are appearing in very different ways in these solutions? Ari? Is it coming from the gamma matrices? Yeah. So we have established a set of gamma matrices that are different for the different coordinates. And it's actually the fact, it's the specific form of the gamma matrices that are pairing up with the momentum components to put these in different places. What you can do is, uh, if you wanted, you could go back and, so, so if you wanted to make this all symmetric, what you could do is you could interchange the components of the momentum, but then you would also have to go and interchange the gamma matrix assignments, and then the solutions would just actually appear with permutations of x, y, and z everywhere. Okay, so it's the equation itself doesn't treat x, y, and z exactly the same because the gamma matrices are different. Okay, that's a really good observation. Though. Okay, so what I was trying to do, uh, well, actually, I established that uh, uh, these things are now eigenstates, and... So, so the idea here is if I choose to <laughs> classify, I chose that. <laughs> All right, no mistakes. Just testing gravity. A little microgravity experiment. Uh, so if instead of thinking about SZ and eigenstates of SZ, which I've already argued is not a good classification when things are moving, if instead I like to think about the eigenvalue of spin along the direction of momentum, then I am classifying things by what is called their helicity. So we are working now with a classification in terms of helicity eigenstates, where helicity is simply defined as the spin operator, but along the momentum direction. Okay? And so what we're talking about when we talk about these helicity eigenstates is if the particle is moving with some spatial momentum in, say, that direction, then there is a eigen, an eigenstate where the eigenvalue of the momentum operator is plus h bar over 2, and a state where the eigenvalue of the helicity operator is minus h bar over 2, and that would correspond to a, a spin anti-aligned with the momentum. Of course, aligned and anti-aligned is loosely used here because you're never perfectly aligned with an axis in quantum mechanics. Okay, so spin up and spin down now becomes spin along the momentum and spin anti-aligned to the momentum. So I'm going to talk about helicity for a few minutes, and that's going to feel really good. You're all going to be like, helicity, that's cool. And then I'm going to talk about something hard. Okay? So, um, so let's talk about helicity. Helicity is, 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 is fantastic. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, right out of it. I mean, you say helicity, you really just mean... Along the All that I'm saying with so helicity is something which first of all only means anything for something that's moving. Because you have to have a momentum direction. And all we're doing with helicity is saying if I'm moving, there's already a preferred axis. Why don't I use that as my z axis in in specifying my spin up and spin down configurations? But more importantly than that we found that if I picked any other axis, those solutions were not eigenstates of the spin operator. I have to use the helicity, the, using the spin along the axis of the momentum to get eigenstates, okay? 
So in many ways, uh, helicity, classifying things by their helicity value is similar to classifying things by their spin um, along z. So for example, um, I can have a particle which is in a state with a spin eigenvalue along the z-axis of plus h bar over 2, or one with an eigenvalue which is minus h bar over 2, and I can actually, for that very same particle, I can switch the eigenvalue of SZ between plus and minus with a coordinate transformation, right? So if I'm working with a set of coordinates like this, and I have a particle which has its spin aligned along the z-axis, or spin up along the z-axis, not perfectly aligned, okay? Without doing anything to the particle, I can just do a rotation of my coordinate system. Oh, God. <laughs> Rotations are so hard. Okay, there we go. That's a legit rotation, just rotating around the x-axis. Okay? But if the particle is still happily sitting there with its spin pointing up, it's now spin down along the z-axis. Okay? Well, it turns out that if I look at a state with positive helicity, I can actually turn that into a state with negative helicity by doing the following. So I have a momentum. It's moving perhaps to the right. Just one second, Michelle. And then for the positive helicity state, I'm going to have it spin aligned with the momentum. But then what I can do is I can, so rotation in the YZ, I can boost in the plane of P and T, or boost along the direction of the momentum, to a frame of reference which is moving faster than the particle. If I boost to a frame which is moving faster than the particle, what happens to the direction of the particle's momentum, Allie? Um, the particle's moving to the right, and then I start running faster than the particle. What do I see the particle do? Uh, yeah, I actually reverse the direction of the momentum. That's not going to do anything to the spin. So I have just, by virtue of running faster than the particle, switched a positive helicity state to a negative helicity state. Rochelle, what was your question? Oh, I was just like, going to say like, that the diagrams, like the one on the right is left-handed, and the one on the left is two axes. So. <laughs> no, the one on the left is two axes. I'm saying why. You wrote your why. Why is weird on the left? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 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 no, 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 I did, I did, I did horrible stuff. Oh, I did horrible stuff, so that's what I meant to write. Now it's totally messed up. Michelle, Michelle, do not ever let me pause to answer your questions, because you're always going to fix what I've broken. Okay, there we go, sorry. Um, yeah, we need to be writing, we need to be working with right-handed coordinate system. So right-handed coordinate system, right-handed coordinate system, they're related by a rotation. Are we all good? Spencer, what? It's okay. <laughs> So, um, now here's the interesting observation. Ready? Spin along Z can always be reversed. Helicity can almost always be reversed. When can it not be reversed? When something is massless. Was Matty saying it? Yep, Matty was saying it. When something is massless. Because when something is massless and it's moving to the right, there is no way for you to change that with a change of reference frames. You could obviously you know, hit it and interact with it. But just by doing a coordinate transformation, you can't reverse its direction. Okay? So there is a certain sense in which for massless particles, plus and minus velocity eigenstates can be thought of as distinct particles in the sense that if you're born with helicity plus h bar over 2, there is nothing that can be done to change that. And if you're born with helicity minus h bar over 2, there's nothing that can be done to change that. So it is, in a sense, a conserved quantum number for massless particles. It can't be changed. That's not true for massive particles. Because a massive particle born with plus h bar over 2 
Well, I can just change my reference frame and make it minus h bar over 2. OK? So this is sort of akin to just talking about the total spin. Like if a particle is born with total spin 1 half, there's nothing you can do to change that. It's, it, that's the big difference between spin and orbital angular momentum. If something has orbital angular momentum, you can kick it and change the orbital angular momentum. But if it's born with spin a half, it's spin a half till it's dead. If it's massless and it's born with positive helicity, it's positive helicity till it's dead. Spencer, are you going to commit to asking a question or what? No, it's a new question. So, oh, it's a new question. Okay, good. So with the okay, so the vector doesn't really change, even though we boosted or something's happened and like now it's negative. It's still facing. Same direction. Nope. Like, nope. there's nothing about the conservation we can say. Nope. No. I mean, literally, like, the notion that something is moving in a certain direction is completely frame dependent if it's moving subluminally. Because I can always reverse the direction of its motion by boosting to a frame moving faster. The momentum? The it's spin. pointing in. Oh, the spin. I'm not changing the spin, is what I'm saying. The spin is staying the same. It's the momentum that I'm reversing. I know, but you're you're conserving something in the spin, aren't you? Or like it's I don't know. Like you're saying that you can't switch. You can switch the spin, but technically the spin is not really switching. So I feel like that like I don't know. That's concerning. Well, no, I I okay yeah I I so what I'm saying is I'm so yes. I will agree with what you're saying, but what we really want to come down to is our description of the spin. And our description of the spin is, it usually entails picking an axis and then projecting the spin onto that axis. And all I'm saying is that description can change. What was plus in one coordinate system can become minus in another. Even though I agree with you, the spin is, is not changing its direction. All I'm doing is changing my description of it. The description is changing. However, for massless particles, there is no changing the description. If it's plus, it's plus for any, anyone and everybody. Except, except if, it's like if you're moving your frame at light speed. No, we're not going to go there. <laughs> let's, just, let's just not even talk about that. There is, there is no boosting. So we, we want to talk about that. transfer. You can't boost to right, light right. speed. You can boost as close as you want, but not to it. OK, okay so, so before we move on to the really difficult thing, um, I want to connect back to something that we talked about last time. And this is um, the idea of uh, the Wigner classification. Okay? So we talked about last time how if I want to classify the degrees of freedom of, of, of a particle or a system, then one thing that I can do is I can give it some momentum, for momentum if we're in a relativistic context, and then once I give it that four momentum, I can then ask what transformations am I allowed to do which preserve the four momentum? And so the last time we came together, we talked about how if the counting of degrees of freedom is frame independent, like if it's three, it's three, it doesn't matter who's observing it, then you might as well pick the simplest frame, and that is the rest frame, when you can go to a rest frame, and then the form of the four momentum uh, vector, sorry, thanks. It's the four momentum vector, not the dual. So this would be MC zero vector. And then we said, hey, look, I can do any SO3 on this I want, and I won't change the four momentum. Okay? And so that's why we ended up classifying particle states according to how they transform under rotations in three spatial dimensions. We talked about vectors and spinners and scalars. Okay. That's the massive case. But now we should also consider the massless case. In the massless case, we again should have a four vector momentum. This time it's going to be describing something moving at the speed of light. However, this is not an option. Okay? You can't go to the rest frame of a massless particle. This expression wouldn't really make sense. Okay? But you can still write down the four momentum of a massless particle, and for simplicity, 
we will just assume that the four momentum or the spatial momentum is aligned with one of the coordinate axes. Okay? And so if we do that, we can write down a four momentum vector for a particle moving at the speed of light, and it would look something like this. The first term would be E over C. And if it's, say, moving along the X, it doesn't matter what direction I pick right now. If it's moving along the X direction, then this would be uh, PX, which would also be E over C. Okay, because remember, what I want to have happen is that P mu, P mu, which is uh, when I dualize, this guy picks up a minus sign, this would end up being minus E squared over C squared plus E squared over C squared, and what I want is for that to be zero, because P mu squared is always going to be M squared C squared, or maybe M squared C, M squared C to the fourth, M squared C, I don't remember the fact of power of C, it doesn't matter, because in this case it's massless, this is zero. Okay? So all I'm saying is these two terms have to be equal because with the minus sign from dualizing, they have to multiply together or they have to square and then subtract to zero, okay? Now I want to look at all transformations that I can do on this, which is not going to change the form of that four vector. And what set of transformations is that? It's SO2. So the little group for a massless particle is smaller than the little group for a massive particle. And by the way, everything I'm saying pertains to vectors and it also pertains to spinners. So for example, when you talk about the photon or light being transversely polarized, that is exactly realizing that the little group for a massless vector field is SO2 as opposed to SO3. But let's take this and go back to these observations. In this case, if I have a, uh, let's see, yeah, so in this case, if I have a plane that I am free to rotate in, and I have a spin, then because I'm free to do whatever SO3 rotation I want, I can always invert the component of the spin along whatever axis, just by doing a rotation. Okay? That's what we talked about a few minutes ago. However, in this case, if I have my particle moving along the x-axis, and it's positive helicity, say the helicity is along the x-axis, then the only thing that I'm allowed to do in the or identification of the degrees of freedom is an SO2 transformation in the plane perpendicular to that. But if all I can do is rotate in the YZ plane, can I switch the sign of that spin? No. Okay. So all I'm pointing out is that identifying that you cannot, that this is not a degree of freedom to change for massless particles also plays out in this classification story. All right, you ready? So I wish that there was a really simple way to say what I'm about to say. And I have stewed and stewed and stewed and tried to make this something you can sink your teeth into, and I have just not come up with it yet. So I'm just going to lay it out there and send you on your four-day weekend to chew on it. We've talked about helicity, and now I want to talk about chirality. And the problem that most people encounter in helicity and chirality is that uh, there are situations where helicity and chirality are ba basically describing the same thing, but in general they are not. And it turns out that for uh, purposes of the standard model, particularly when we want to talk about symmetry, spontaneous symmetry breaking, when we want to talk about 
uh, the weak interactions and the way the weak interactions affect things, we really need to be thinking in terms of chirality, not in terms of helicity. Okay? So um, let's talk about uh, chirality for a moment. So remember we have a four-component spinner that is a solution to the Dirac equation if you put in all the, the various bits that I've written for both the, the rest at rest and the non-zero momentum solutions. But if we look at the form of the generators that affect Lorentz transformations, these are the sigmas, the sigma mu nu's. For the boosts, if you actually go in and crunch the form of those particular generators, we find that they have this nice block diagonal form. And for the rotations, so i, j are spatial. So this is a time-space rotation, which is a boost. This is a space-space rotation, which is a rotation. And so in this case, I have epsilon i, j, k, and then sigma k, 0, 0, sigma k, where the sigmas that are appearing here are just the poly matrices. So i, j, and k take values uh, x, y, z, or 1, 2, 3. Pick your poison. Okay. And what we notice is that, so these are the generators, but we know that using the exponential map, the, the rough matrix form of the generators, by which I mean are they diagonal, are they block diagonal, or whatever, that is going to essentially descend to a form of the actual transformation matrix. So it's probably not a hard pill to swallow that if you have a block diagonal generator, you're going to end up with a block diagonal transformation matrix. So what we discover is that under boosts and rotations, psi 1 and psi 2 get transformed into each other. And then separately, psi 3 and psi 4 get transformed into each other. And we don't mix the top two and the bottom two. Okay? So this leads us to define what we call psi plus and psi minus, where psi plus is the upper two parts of the Dirac spinner and psi minus are the lower two. And we can think of the plus and minus as distinguishing how they transform under the boost generators, okay, with a relative minus sign. They transform the same way under the rotations, okay? Now, these little two component guys, so these are two component spinners now, um, are called vial spinners, after Mr. Herman Weil, Wolfgang's great great granddad. Okay. And now we're going to do something really interesting, okay? So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the Dirac Lagrangian, which we wrote like two, yeah, two, two lectures ago, and then we derived the Dirac equation from it. But the Dirac, the Dirac Lagrangian was just uh, h-bar c, the adjoint spinner, gamma mu d mu psi, plus mc squared psi bar psi where recall that the dual spinner we defined to be i psi dagger gamma zero, where, in case you forgot, gamma zero is minus i times that guy, where these are four by four matrices, these are four component spinners, this is all the four component version of this story, okay? And then what you can do is you can take this version of the story written in terms of psi and psi bar, and you can just ask, well, what would it look like if I broke it up into psi plus and psi minus? So literally, if everywhere I saw a psi, I put a psi plus and a psi minus, explicitly calling out those components. Of course, you would need the dual, and you can work out what the dual version of this would look like by using the dualization process, and I'll just show you what the result ends up being. Uh, psi bar would be psi minus dagger psi plus dagger. 
So it's a little counterintuitive. When you take the adjoint, you actually switch the positions and then Hermitian conjugate. Okay. Again, you don't have to take my word for it. You can actually do this operation on psi written this way. Okay. But what's really interesting is if you take this form of psi, take this form of psi bar, stuff it into this Lagrangian, you find the following. Introducing some new notation that sigma mu is defined to be, in this case, the identity times a vector of poly matrices, and sigma mu bar is defined as the identity times minus the vector of poly matrices. Okay, so this is obviously the first term here because it's the one that involves the derivatives. So there should be a gamma mu there. All right. And, and really, the reason why you have this distinction here is, is it just owes to this difference in the way that the boosts are acting. Yeah, Matt. Uh, I'm sure you're getting this. The notation for the psi plus minus. Here? Yeah. So psi minus dagger. Well, those are daggers. Huh? Yeah, it's, everything up top is a dagger. The plus and minus are down below. Sorry, my daggers kind of look like pluses. Sorry about it. Plus and minus. Okay, I could if I if I don't have a red marker, I would draw I would draw blood dripping off the bottom of the daggers, and then it would be obvious. But anyway, yes, they're daggers. Um, okay, so this is obviously the term. And I, look, the details of this, you know, you just plug it in, you crank it out. It's it's not obvious, but this term obviously descends from this one. And now we write the mass term, and the mass term looks like this. notice what is interesting about that mass term it looks like an anti-commutator an anti-commutator in a sense of uh, first elements permission conjugate and then a second element of yeah so so it, it mixes the plus and the minus it mixes the elements from the top with the elements from the bottom. Okay? I mean, you can see that explicitly. They're multiplied together. <clears throat> that doesn't happen in the first term. It's minus, minus, and plus, plus. Okay? Now, where this gets interesting is the following observation. If m is 0, then there is no mass term. And the Lagrangian literally becomes the sum of a term only involving the minus parts and a term only involving the plus parts. What that means is that it is completely consistent to think of a theory which only has these terms and does not have these terms, so long as the particle in question is massless. Because if it's massless, this term doesn't exist. This is the sum of two independent terms, so if I just ignored one of them, I have a consistent theory. However, to flip that around, in order to have mass, you must have both the plus contribution and the minus contribution, because if either one of them is zero, this term is zero, whether m is zero or not. Okay. Franco's thinking deep in the back of the room, man. Hell, his head is horizontal. Yeah, Spencer. I've never constructed a theory before, but I'll take your word on it. 
so, well, oh, okay. so, so, uh, uh, so if I have if I have a if I have a Lagrangian for a uh, a ball that is falling, mm -hmm. and then I have a Lagrangian for another ball that is falling, and I write down their kinetic terms, they're two independent kinetic terms. You know, kinetic term for ball one, kinetic term for ball two, and then I can write down their interaction under gravity while they're falling, and there'll be an mgh1 and an mgh2. All of those terms are independent and added together, and so I could completely ignore ball two, scratch out all the two terms, and then I'd have the kinetic for one and the, and the potential for two, and everything would make sense. Right? That would be consistent. Yeah. Now, let's take those two objects and connect them by a spring, and then let them fall. Suddenly, you've got this piece of the story that doesn't really make sense if you erase one of those objects. Right? Oh. Because the spring part, like what the hell's the spring doing if it's just attached to one thing? So there would be this term in your Lagrangian which depends on the horizontal displacement of the two objects, and that term wouldn't make sense if one of those objects were suddenly gone. So you can kind of think of this mass term as a thing which is linking the plus and the minus states, and if you if you erased one of those states, then that term just doesn't make sense. You can't do anything with it. But if you if you erase the mass, or if you get rid of the spring, and you just got two objects falling, it's perfectly consistent to ignore one and then just describe the physics of the other. So, sin psi plus and psi minus are boosts and rotations. Psi and plus and psi minus? Yes. No, psi plus and psi minus are components of the four spinner solution They're to the graph equation. Oh, that's sad. Okay, what are they? These are the top two components. <laughs> <laughs> They're called plus and minus because when you enact a boost, one of them comes with a plus sign here and one of them comes with a minus sign here. But, but these are not the size. These you would use to build a rotation matrix which you would then apply to the side. So my balls are either... <laughs> had to happen. <laughs> They're either time and y component or x and z component. Or enormous. <laughs> <laughs> That's the song to say. Yeah, I know. No, it's, yeah. it's, 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 I know, I know, I know, I know. We're not going to go there. We're really not going to go there. Wolfgang. Is it better to think of psi plus and psi minus as the uh, particle and antiparticle? No, no, no. No. Okay. No, 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 no. Yeah. Somehow it's like the mass. No, I don't even know. So, look, look, I'm, I'm, the fact that you're not comfortable with this notion of chirality and splitting this thing, that's fine. Like, I'm not super comfortable with it. It's, it's, here's where it gets really weird. Talking about psi plus and psi minus for a massless particle becomes synonymous with talking about plus and minus helicity states. Okay. Okay. So remember, if, if we look at the form of one of the solutions, so if I take like psi 1 for a moving particle, so a, e to the i, p mu, x mu over h bar over mc squared minus pz over mc, minus px over mc, minus i py over mc, one, zero. Okay, now watch. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, I'm going to align the coordinates with the z-axis. Okay, so that will simplify this a bit. So now I've got something that looks like that. Okay? But if you're massless, then this term right here is zero. That's just the mass shell condition, where you're setting m equals to zero. So if you're massless, this solution just becomes zero, zero, one, zero. And you can take the other three solutions, and you'll find that they reduce to one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, zero, da, 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 which is a basis for this decomposition. Right, and then two of those would align to the sign minus Say that again? Two of, them, two, of them have, two of them would be like, I don't know, when you talk about chirality, you talk about like left, right, or I don't know. Some of them, two of them would be psi minus, two of them would be psi plus, and those would be like unchangeable. Yeah. 
versus if you have a massless thing or massive thing. It's crazy. Yes. So, so look, at, at, at this point, it might seem like somewhat arbitrary to pick these two and then these two. But if you looked at all of the expressions that I've been writing down for the solutions and everything, there's always been this natural structure where stuff was going on here and then it was mirrored down here. And what I'm, all I'm trying to point out is in the massless limit, that becomes very concrete. But there is a way to define this splitting even before you take the massless limit. And that's what chirality is. Trying to distinguish these things before, so trying to think of helicity before you take the massless limit is not useful because you can reverse helicity just by changing coordinate systems, okay? But chirality is something which you cannot change with a change of coordinate system. You, you can't take these two things and turn and move them where their location in this spinner just by doing a boost or a rotation. It ain't gonna happen because of this block diagonal form. This block diagonal form is only gonna take something in the top and keep it in the top, and something in the bottom and keep it in the bottom, and it doesn't matter if you're doing a boost or a rotation, so these only play with themselves. <laughs> so chirality states, if you're in the psi plus, you're only gonna stay in the psi plus, and the psi minus, you're gonna stay in the psi minus. It doesn't matter what you do to the coordinates, okay? There is a connection to helicity for massless particles. Okay. okay. Now I'll just I'll finish up with an observation and get you out of here. And that is everything that I have done, and Rochelle could Rochelle will be sensitive to this, everything that I have done is couched in the particular choice of gamma matrices that I've made. Okay, you know, gamma zero takes a certain form, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. So you might ask yourself. If you picked a different basis of gamma matrices, would you still be talking about the top two and the bottom two? Or would you be talking about like the top and the third or, or some linear combination? And so what we would really like to do is have a basis independent way of specifying positive chirality and negative chirality. And the way to do that and this is sort of the punchline of this, is using something which you have played with that have not appreciated the significance of, and that is gamma phi. Gamma phi is defined to be minus i, gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, and in our particular representation, if you write down what this looks like as a matrix, it actually just comes out to be 1 minus 1, where everything's 2 by 2s. So what you can do with that is you can form a projection operator and if you act with that projection operator on psi, if you use the plus version, when you act on psi, the one here is gonna grab this, the minus one's gonna grab this, but put a minus in front of it, and so since you're adding, the minus contribution's gonna disappear, and this is just gonna return psi plus, and similarly, P minus is going to return psi minus. Okay? So in this particular example, with our gamma matrices in this convention, you can see concretely that this matrix can be used to project an arbitrary four component spinner onto these two chiral pieces. But then what you can argue, and you proved part of this in your homework, is that in general, gamma five squared is zero. Did you say your mom? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a horrible person. <laughs> well, you can, okay, screw you guys. You can, <laughs> you can prove that a projection operator defined in terms of gamma 5 
in general, this is not using this particular matrix, but just using the properties of the gamma matrices and their algebras, you can prove that these operators squared are themselves. That, of course, is the behavior indicative of a projection operator. So this definition of gamma 5, which doesn't rely on any particular convention, this definition of gamma 5 guarantees us we can construct a projection operator. In this particular case, it is the projection operator that grabs the positive and negative chirality components of the spinner. And so using gamma 5, we can identify positive and negative chirality completely independent of the convention or basis for the gamma matrices that we're working with. And so that's what's going to make the role of gamma 5 so important in this class. Is it is a, it's an invariant way of saying positive chirality and negative chirality. And one of the things that we're going to discover is so weird about the weak interactions when we study them is that they treat this differently than this. Unlike all of the other interactions, the electromagnetic and the strong. Okay? All right, that's enough for today. I'm burning up. Let's go on. Hey, Alex. Yeah. What's the uh, homework situation with the So, yeah, the, well, the homework situation is that I am going to assign you uh, some questions from this. I'm going to assign you some questions from next Thursday's material, and it will be due the following Tuesday. So not, obviously not due the Tuesday that we're not here, but the, the week from now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> is there such thing as a gamma 4? Um, I'll be talking about that.